the other novel invention we have, which applies specifically to classical artificial neural networks, not the type of artificial neural network I was describing a moment ago, is called our neural network uh, recursive optimization. And the way this works is it's basically a way of looking at a classical artificial intelligence neural network and figuring out how significant each synapse is to the final output. And by computationally finding out the significance of each synapse, you can then prune the synapses such that you remove the ones that are least significant and create new synapses and then test those to see after the after the network stabilizes you test those to see what their significance is and keep basically the most significant synapses and drop the least significant ones and from that you're able to create a network which is sparser than a fully connected artificial neural network that um, still retains almost the same efficiency as, or I should say the same uh, accuracy in its answer as a fully connected network so you can and ultimately you can't really represent a fully connected network anyway in most situations because you just don't have the processing power so you need to pick your pruning somehow and most people will either use um, very ineffective algorithms do it or usually they'll actually just do it by hand uh, in some very systematic way so this gives a way to basically prune those uh, in a more efficient uh, manner if you have limited resources and that ultimately comes down to uh, some of the evolutionary stuff uh, can also use similar algorithms, at least in theory. Uh, could use similar algorithms even on uh, other on other algorithms that aren't artificial neural networks. You could use a similar approach to calculate the significance of each edge, but that's not something we've done for other network types yet, but it's conceivable that you could possibly do something very similar for some other types of networks as well. But in that case, it's specifically targeted to artificial uh, neural networks in the classic sense at the moment. Any questions on that? And now I'm basically going to talk about the engines. These, these technologies are stepping stones to uh, three ultimate engines or products. Uh, open mesh, open cell, and open world. And you can even really think of them more as suites of products. But they're, in the in the case of open mesh, we're talking about um, a algorithm. In, and open mesh is an algorithm itself, not just a, an engine, but the, sort of a bit of both, or at least it will be um, once we uh, once we get a little farther along on it. It, it handles mesh networking type concerns. Um, if you have limited concerns over a network or li limited resources over a network. How do you um, distribute those resources in a way that doesn't require a central authority? Uh, all mesh networks out there right now basically either require some sort of a central authority in sense of setting it up and telling um, the nodes explicitly um, who winds up routing from one subnet to another and things like that. Just, you know, classic IP, IPv4 kind of stuff just over um, with a mesh network uh, representing your subnet, basically. But they don't scale to internet sizes. You can't just take a single mesh network and scale it to the size of the internet. It just won't work. And uh, open mesh is a collection of algorithms that basically make that possible. But not just for mesh networking in terms of computer networking, but also what we're trying to do is um, distributed processing. And that not only involves, uh, one term I use a lot is context-aware distributed processing. What that means is you're aware of the network you're distributing your processing over and you're aware of not only the processing power of the individual nodes within your network but how much those nodes can talk to each other because we're not just distributing stuff that can be comp computed in an isolated manner we're distributing algorithms that are interdependent on each other so it's not it can't just be distributed anywhere to any computer they need to be distributed such that two nodes that need to talk to each other a great deal need to have the bandwidth and the latency that is suited for that particular communication within how they're distributed across the network. So to do that, you need a context-aware system. You need to know how fast the systems are across the network, what sort of bandwidth they have between them, and so on and so forth. So open mesh is ultimately about managing the network side of those resources as well, not just mesh networking, but knowing 
you know, who can get how much of a particular bandwidth and who can get um, access to going through particular nodes and so on and so forth. So it's, it's the, the algorithm that manages in a decentralized way the resources from the network side, not the processing side. OpenCell, which is the other one that I mentioned, basically handles that same equation from the processing side. Those are the algorithms that basically handle how it distributes processing across the open mesh network. Now OpenCell is built, built on top of open mesh because on the open cell side it's not just um, it needs to be context aware for the processing speed and the network speed whereas the open mesh side is just the network speed components or I should say network characteristics because it's more than just speed. Um, so open cell is very much an encapsulation and extension of open mesh to then take it to processing as well. So open open cell as a whole you can consider as a platform for generic uh, distributed processing. And it really doesn't have to have anything to do with the evolutionary side. It will in a second I'll explain how. But it can really anything you can represent in a graph format, it can distribute across its network and then compute um, stuff in a distributed fashion. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to deal with AI or um, evolutionary computing in and of itself. Now the next component that I mentioned, open world, is the encapsulation even further of open cell to basically add those evolutionary components. So now we're taking this engine that can do distributed computing and now using it to distribute our AI components. And then that's mixed in basically with so open world is where we start throwing in the things like genetic wavelets and the hype. Well, the hypersociative map basically went into open mesh, and open world. So it, it's a little farther down. But the genetic wavelets I mentioned uh, start uh, factoring in when you talk about open world, as well as uh, some of the other components that I had mentioned. So open world is ultimately that the full suite in a sense of all these components brought together to make an evolutionary platform that is itself distributed across as many computers across the internet as uh, want to participate, basically. And that is our summary of our engine and some of the con constituent uh, technologies. I said I was going to go back a little to our how we model our, our graph theory stuff, because that, that's very central to everything else, and I think now that everyone understands all the, the components, it'll be a little easier for me to explain that as well. It's, uh, it's specifically referred to as the... Uh, hierarchical injection graph, at least that's the term we're using right now, which is just a way of describing the uh, the way we model graphs uh, within our system. Now before I, uh, before I go into that, any questions about anything I've went over so far? Okay. All right, so the hierarchical injection graph is a fancy term for saying that we have a very generic model for what a graph is. Now, I described earlier a graph is a very simple example of having a bunch of nodes or dots on a piece of paper connected by edges. Uh, but in reality, graphs can be much more general than that. They, the edges don't need to be lines connecting one, ed one node to another. They can be something called a hyper edge as well, which is an edge that connects a group of nodes together. Uh, think of it as a set and you have multiple sets that you can create of, of the various nodes. So a hyper edge is basically a node that doesn't just have two endpoints but can have any number of endpoints. Uh, you also have things like undirected edges versus directed edges. You even have things as fancy as bi-directed edges where you basically have communication that can go in both directions and it might there might be certain rules as to how it goes in one direction and not the other direction and stuff like that. Um, and these are all classic ideas, things like the hypergraph and things like that. Now, the hierarchical injection graph basically takes that a step further and says, when you have these ideas of graphs, whatever kind of graph you have, you can represent the graph um, in a nested fashion as well, such that nodes themselves can essentially be graphs internally. They can have some sort of graph internally. And that graph may actually be useful in how that node processes some information that's passing through it in the parent graph. And edges themselves can also be graphs but they're a special type of graph where certain nodes within their graph needs to also be present in the parent graph, but not all of them need to be. A node itself, uh, to the parent graph, a parent doesn't really care what's inside a node. Um, it can be another graph, it can be anything, computationally speaking. Um, if you think of the case of an artificial neural network, um, each node would basically be um, 
one neuron within that neural network. And internally, the kind of stuff it's doing is the transfer function and summing up its inputs. And it basically sums up all the signals that come in the input, pass it through a transfer function, and stick that in the output, more or less. Now, you could represent that as a graph. You could represent it as just a math function. You could represent it as whatever you want internally. It doesn't matter. The parent graph doesn't care what's going on inside a neuron. Um, and from that, you can have multiple levels of abstraction, where the neuron itself could, for whatever reason, have an entire graph inside that somehow defines how its input gets processed to its output, and those nodes can have additional graphs and so on and so forth. So the case of a, of a node um, representing a graph is fairly easy to understand in that sense because anything can be inside of it, and a graph is just one thing it could be. Um, in the case with an edge, it's a little bit um, more complex than that. Picture a hyper edge, for example, that um, basically is a set or surrounds four nodes in a parent graph how those nodes talk to each other through that hypergraph or through that hyper edge uh, might have some sort of rules defined by it. The, the hyper edge, for example, might represent that it's going to sum up the value of all of those nodes and then stick that value in one node that, that is within that hyper edge, for example. That might be the, the thing that that hyper edge is representing. If that's the case, then you might have a graph that can represent that such that you have arrows pointing from all the nodes that are summing together into the node that's being added to get added into. So you sum up sum them all together and stick it into that node. So there's an implied set of edges there that is within that edge. Now to the parent graph you don't need to represent those edges because the parent graph doesn't care. The hyper edge can basically take care of that processing. Um, compartmentalize that, modularize it such that the, the hyper edge does all that. But ultimately the hyper edge has those edges in it. Now the difference between the hyper edge and the node here is the fact that with the hyper edge, the nodes that are in that, that hyper edge are also um, inside the parent graph. The parent graph is aware of those nodes. It sees the nodes and the hyper edge around it. Whereas any nodes that are inside another node, the, the parent graph wouldn't see. So that's really the distinction between how a hyper edge can act as a graph and a node can act as a graph. It's actually a bit more complicated than that, but I think that's. Um, close enough that you guys can get a sense for um, what's going on there. Now ultimately what happens is you can have very unique things that get evolved out of this. Where you can have, for example, um, Bayesian networks where neural networks evolve inside the nodes of Bayesian networks. And those neural networks ultimately will define the prop or will help um, divert the probability for a particular um, e each node in a Bayesian network represents a conditional probability, one feature. So it can, the, the neural network can help modify its prediction, basically, that it's sticking out as far as how that particular um, conditional feature shows up, it, its statistical uh, pattern, so to speak. And it can modify that because it has it internally and create something entirely new. It's no longer a Bayesian network. It's some sort of a hybrid between a Bayesian network and a neural network. And that's uh, one thing that we've actually seen evolve because we a lot of the stuff we work with, for example, is playing with neural networks and Bayesian networks because they talk such different languages and they're uh, one of the early things that we've demonstrated. So in the case of that, uh, we've used the, uh, we've created this new type of a network that's basically a Bayesian network with embedded neural networks and so on and so forth. So from the evolution, it can create these patterns of networks inside networks that ultimately somehow do the processing and create this hybrid technology that even though it's built from components of traditional and novel algorithms that we've developed, it itself is an entirely new novel algorithm. It's just lending from existing ideas. And it's not all that different from what humans do when they invent new algorithms. You know, they understand how algorithms already work out there. They gain inspiration from them, and from that develop new algorithms based off of the concepts they've learned from existing ones, but are entirely different in the way they function, in the way, you know, their steps, so on and so forth. Uh, for example, if you look at Bayesian networks, you have a class of them called dy dynamic Bayesian networks, and one of the types of networks in there is called a uh, hidden Markov model, for example, which basically contains a Markov chain uh, inside the node of a Bayesian network uh, node. So you see that already happening in algorithms that have already been invented, where they've taken concepts and basically done exactly what the evolutionary system would have done. Take the algorithm, stick it as a component that's inside a node of an existing algorithm. Now you have this hybrid algorithm where they talk to each other and they affect each other. And that's ultimately what happens with the hidden Markov model, but you have all these other things like the, the layered... Um, uh, I can't remember the name of it. It's the, the layered um, uh, 
it's on there. Give me a sec. Layered hidden Markov models. That's what I was um, thinking of. That's another one, which is similar in the sense that you have basically uh, Markov models embedded inside other Markov models. Uh, nodes embedded inside nodes. So nodes contain reflections of themselves or the same type of algorithm, just an, another graph inside themselves. So that's another example of something that a human being developed that is basically what we're doing here, just using evolutionary algorithms where they're taking graphs and reorganizing them in creative ways. So that's ultimately what this whole thing comes down to and why we need that flexibility in our graph theory in the first place. Because you can't really create anything very original if you don't have a domain that's flexible to begin with. We also um, model in that way for one other very important reason, and that's so the components that the evolutionary algorithm has to build with. I mean, if you can, if you consider the evolutionary algorithm like hands, and this I'm taking this from Dr. Pei Wang, he used this analogy, and it's a great analogy. Consider the AI like hands, and the traditional AI like tools. Ultimately, you need a, the tool needs to be built for the hand. A hammer is built for a human hand, but it might not work too well for an alien hand, for example. So the hand and the tool needs to be built together. And you can't just start picking up these tools and start using them without having the right physiology to do so. And that's ultimately where this system comes in, where it's evolving. Well, it, it's using a model where the tools are defined already, and the hands are getting evolved to use the tools, rather than the other way around with humans, where we evolve the tools to, for our hands. You know, we, we stick the, the tools here, the classic AI algorithms, as components in a graph, uh, you know, nodes and edges, and then the evolutionary algorithm, since it already knows how to pick them up, because every node is a node. I mean, it doesn't need to care what kind of node it is. It just knows it's a node of some sort. It can pick that up, pick up the edges, and start hooking them together. And because it's this, uh, it uses a structure which is already known, uh, you don't need to go and reinvent the wheel every time you create a new algorithm and want to stick it in there. It's just as long as it's represented as a graph, these hands can pick it up and manipulate it. So that's ultimately why it needs to be in a generic form. Everything needs to be in a graph form because that way you have the same types of components that the system can manipulate.